Yeah, welcome to my talk. So, actually, that's me. I'm active in Kubernetes for whatever, five or six or seven years now, uh, from the very beginning. I'm doing now mostly Kubernetes security and critical infrastructure. I founded two companies, but this is not the topic here. I uh, have several pro bono memberships in AG Critis, so dealing with critical infrastructure. I keep planning on that, contribute a little bit as consultant to Gaia X, which is kind of European answer to the big hyperscaler clouds. But the main topic here is, uh, yeah, how is it evolving? So we have DevOps, we have continuous security monitoring, which has mentioned, has been mentioned but not implemented yet in our environment, we have SEC DevOps, so it occurred in 2016 also, something like chaos, security chaos engineering. And uh, then later came DevSecOps as a buzzword. GitOps is very popular, so we have all these things. And now let's look how this with containers and security fits into um, the picture. So, normally what I recommend is uh, to my customers in critical infrastructure not to use the German uh, versions of uh, uh, the um, documents, but there is a very good document by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and I'm not really uh, pro-military, but it's also by the U.S. Department of Defense. They have all the documents you need to implement a DevSecOps process. So what you see here is they took the DevOps process and added security to every step of it. That's part of the general uh, strategy. Add security to every step of your pipeline which is hard, but effectively it works sometimes. Um, this is Kubernetes nowadays, so we have Kubernetes everywhere. So we start started in, in uh, trading and uh, Pokemon was the first application, but you also have it in ships, have it in banks, you have it in healthcare, you have it in transmission grid and electrical systems, you have it even in F-16 uh, airplanes. So um, all these systems are critical in terms of, yes, we need security here. And uh, this cannot necessarily be connected directly to the cloud. This is my playground. Uh, I'm in projects uh, with the European and the German transmission grids. So uh, this is anything above 110 kilovolt and um, it's about dispatching the load in the grid according to the production in power plants and the consumptions in households and factories. We have a lot of uh, problems here, it's all more or less, it's an IoT system the Internet of Things, but it's very old. It has uh, 90, it has protocols from the 90s, SCADA, and these uh, all must be uh, protected because here failure of the system on a European or German scale is not an option. So if we want to deploy Kubernetes here, we, mon we must care about security. And that's our security model, as you might know it. So it's propagated by the German uh, Bundesamt für Sicherheit in der Informationstechnik, so the Federal um, Office of Information Security. The picture is from British Columbia University, but what is this effectively? So you have several zones, a very high security zone, a high security zone, clients and so on. Effectively, this is this kind of security. You have a medieval castle design, and then you have one mode, two walls, towers, bridges for access. And by the way, this is Belvoir Castle, which, which was the influence castle designed for the next several centuries. So this is our security model in uh, information technology today. But this is uh, Kubernetes battleground. So everything is moving. You don't have uh, a clear separation where you can put a mode or a wall 
um, the pods are coming and going away, so we have to care about that everything is secured in a more dynamic way. The closest approach to that is the carrier strike group from the US. Sorry for all the military uh, uh, pictures here, but here this is the central thing, and anything else around the carrier is just to protect the carrier, which is yeah, kind of medieval castle uh, floating on the ocean. And to get there, what we want to do and what we must do is uh, implement defense in depth. So you have several layers of defense. Uh, each layer can fail. And the idea behind this is that uh, at least if you have one layer who is able to protect you, then the entire system is secure in a way that it can't fail. So let's look how deep is the security in Kubernetes. And effectively you see, and I've done a hack on that, so in the slides there will be a connection to another talk where I hacked an OpenShift cluster uh, from the outside. Um, if you, you see the effective depth in Kubernetes is only three. It could be four, but Kubernetes has a design flaw, so everybody is using service account tokens inside containers, which is only necessary if you have an operator running in that container. But this is more or less a default. What can happen? First thing is your application. Example here is image tragic, but could also be a JNDI application or anything else which is connectable from the outside world. This application can have a flaw anytime because there is log4j shell in it. Um, your your, you have some library which is vulnerable. The next thing you do, and you are the creator of these images, is the installation of the software. So the image creator has its own responsibility, and this is what I want to talk about, that you can get a more more secure and the smaller and therefore also a faster image. The next thing is if you go into role binding in Kubernetes, it's a mess. Nobody really understands role-based access control because this has been designed for machines. And if you copy some advice from the internet, you might introduce a connection of the operator which runs this application by this service account and token and you give it access to the cluster admin. The cluster admin can start anything in your cluster, so even take over the host system. And in the clouds, if you take over the host system, in the host file system, you might find JSON files, which give you access to the cloud account. So let's talk about your responsibility as a developer to secure your containers. Uh, we have had examples in the past. So Log4j was one victim. Spring had something. Jira has something. And if you see, this is the kind of approach you have. If you can get something as a parameter where you can call here Java lang runtime, get runtime exec, you can execute any command in Java. The image tragic um, example was a little bit different. You could hide commands in pictures in that version. So this can be exploited from the outside. So consider your application as insecure as long as you have a Java lang runtime exec in the, in the code, which is probably true all the time. Then you have a, the, the nightmare of security. You have a remote code execution vulnerability. And in deep security, you need to catch that. With this vulnerability, you can execute arbitrary commands in the container from the internet. And you have connection to the internal network if you don't protect it. Full exploit is available here. 
all my examples are on GitHub in my security trainings. So you can read it and the output is all so there that you can follow what I'm telling you here. And uh, it has been tested on OpenShift because this was a challenge. Red Hat always says OpenShift is multi-tenant. It's more secure than the other ones. Yes, it's more secure, but only a little bit. So, and if you have standard images, uh, in that standard images you nearly every time find a curl, and then with the curl you can download as a script kitty. It's not you don't need sophisticated knowledge about Linux or containers. You can download a kubectl with kubectl. You can get the service account token and execute arbitrary commands. Okay, what's in my container? How can I know what's in my container? And this was the outcome of the log for J shell uh, problem. Everybody asked me, yes, do we have, uh, are we affected by log for J shell? This was in last November, I think. And my answer was, yes, uh, if you look into your software bill of material, you immediately find the word, what's a software bill of material? We don't have a software bill of material. Um, the software bill of material covers all licenses and versions of my software and is a necessary uh, output of your CI CD system because otherwise you cannot give this code to somebody else. Normally, you, you have, think you only have Apache licenses, but with an Aferto general public license, you could also be responsible to give the code to everybody outside who is using your code as a service on the internet. So please be careful. You need that software bill of material. If you are building proprietary or open source software, you need it anyway. And it must be produced by everybody who gives software to somebody else. This is a requirement, otherwise you are in big trouble. Especially, uh, I'm in a German government project and there it is a must. Okay, so it's, this is about license compliance. Are we legally clean? And of course, it is about security. Which version of which library do we run? Is it vulnerable or is it not vulnerable? And then you see here, this is a scan of Trivi in Harvard of a Tomcat container last Saturday. You see these are criticals. It's uh, the red one. But if you look here, all these packages where you have vulnerabilities are not connected to Tomcat. So this is something which is definitely hard for security people. They are completely blinded by red um, critical vulnerabilities. And effectively, the Tomcat itself has no vulnerability so far knowing. So if, if I would re scan it today, it could look different. But at the moment, this version of Tomcat itself had no critical vulnerability, but all the tools around in the tool chain. What do we do? So we have lots of false positives. We have a Tomcat container. And effectively, most of Java applications are not interested in curl or Python, and, and not in the security. So um, the tools themselves are attack tools. It doesn't matter if I have a curl or a Python. If I can execute Python code, I can also um, download things from the internet. And we are blinding security. And what we would need here to get it in our CE ICD pipeline propagated, this would mean we would have to create a big CVE ignore uh, maintenance list. So um, this is effort for whatever full-time uh, security people. And this is a waste of time. Uh, the answer was. Uh, I have been in an open source project where we had a similar problem. Uh, just do the usual hardening. Kick out everything which is not needed. How can we know what is not needed? 
and then it can be done by a script at build time. So first answer is use a positive list of files. This is uh, an hardening script, simply using Alpine as the original uh, Nginx based on Alpine as the orig original application, and then you only need that. You need the Nginx itself, some files in etc, some logging, some PID. Why do we need PID files? Because we are in a container and the, P the PID is, is one anyway. So it's, um, yeah, not really clean. We need, might need a cache, we need an etc password because the Nginx must look up, yeah, I'm running as user 110 or something like this, and therefore I need etc password, etc group. Uh, it needs a user share engine X with some library where you need the licenses, var run, var lock, and so on, var cache. And then this is all you need to run an engine X. Yeah, this has doubled. Don't want to confuse you. No. Sorry. Next example, some cut and paste has failed. So effectively, what you create as next is a container from scratch, and you take the output of the hardening script from that container, put it into your container from scratch, and run uh, only the engine X without anything else. So we have no shell, no busy box. Alpine normally is full of busy box. And this means uh, the container is much smaller. I will tell you how much smaller. And effectively, you only have the binary you want to. And what you also see here is the so minus D mind, uh, means please look for uh, the linked Libraries, so it also attaches the shared library which are needed to run this binary. Uh, another example, not as trivial, uh, because I'm in a project where many people use .NET. .NET runs best on Linux. We try and we can really do the same example. And we use the original example from Microsoft, the ASP.NET app and add our script from the internet. By the way, never do this. Now you are running my code in your build system. <laughs> uh, but uh, OK, I don't care because it's my code. Um, and uh, then you need to be root for build time. You can apply the hardening script. Uh, some <laughs> obscure magic with uh, do I need libssl and another library? And then you can do the same trick. You can create a uh, container from scratch. And then the entry point is the ASP.NET application. So this works. ASP is, uh, or .NET is harder because there is a lot of magic in the DLLs, in dependencies. I totally hate this, and I did not go deeper into that. But effectively, if you have knowledge about .NET hardening, you even can uh, kick out more of the uh, original Microsoft DLLs. So, and now look onto the sizes. Engine X latest is 142 megabyte. On Alpine, it's 22.6 megabyte. The hardened version has only 8 megabyte. So, if we compare the latest with our hardened version, it's 17 times smaller. And uh, with the ASP.NET example, we had at least optimized it by a factor of two. This means if we have this step in our deployment pipeline, the volume of the containers shrink by a factor of 10 or more, which is a big step in creating faster pipelines. If you look what we have lost, uh, we cannot debug anymore. So there is no shell in the container. I cannot go into the container. I cannot do a kubectl exec and give me a born shell. 
And this is uh, the price we have to pay. This is a hack which might be helpful for you if you have everything under control. The more structured approach is uh, using a tool like EPCO from the same people who are um, using Alpine, but at the moment it only really works for Alpine. What they have done is they have changed the package format of the internal APK packages to OCI. OCI is the official container image format from the Linux Foundation. So they are using container images as packages in their distribution which is a brilliant idea. And they changed the way they create uh, these images in general. And the response is that you have now sub-second image builds. So Docker run normally takes 20 seconds, minutes, can even be longer. And this means, uh, yeah, it does not... Uh, you. Uh, don't even need a registry because you can create these images on the fly if you want. This is a typical EPCO build file. You say, yes, I want to have this repository and I want to have these packages. That's the entry point and here you see the environment and that's all. So this is uh, building Docker files or OCI images in seconds. And now uh, we, are, we are at a point, okay, we can reconsider the entire way we run our CI CD pipelines and integrate it into the steps. Because what they also did is they implemented signing. Signing for containers and signing for certain programming language packages, so Python is already on the, on the list, signing for images and signing for Helm charts. So you can sign every artifact in your environment. And you can configure your pipeline that only signed code can be passed. So code and artifacts and configurations must be signed now. There is no way of adding something from the side. You can then check if anything is correct. For example, all the container runtimes um, can do some checks on signatures. Normally in Kubernetes now you run something like Creo, and Creo is checking outside of Kubernetes if the image is correctly signed. You can sign, you can look uh, if your Git uh, commits are signed. Harbor, which is the image registry, can, can be configured that it can only pass signed images to your environment. And the CI CD tools like Flux and Argo CD can be configured only to propagate signed helm charts and signed configurations. So this means you have uh, not only GitOps, you have a version of signed GitOps. And you can now create a continuous security monitoring. You know in your cluster that you are only running images and configuration which come out of your deployment pipeline. And your deployment pipeline is only passing signed configurations and images. And this means you are a step closer to control and securing your images. So, how is the adaption? Cosign is a tool to sign, and you already can uh, use GitHub to sign it in GitHub, or in GitLab, or in Kubernetes. And the entire philosophy has been described as SLSA, supply chain levels for software artifact. You can define the level on which you want to have security in your supply chain. In the critical projects where you are in critical infrastructure, you can simply say, yes, I want only signed artifact and configurations. In legacy systems, you can, okay, you can step down a little bit and say, yeah, we allow certain things which are not as secure, but if you set up a new project, a new cluster, or in critical infrastructure, you definitely can insist on signing everything. This is a big step forward for supply chain security. And 
now you are in a stage you know what you are running and you can even prove it because you can show all my configurations require signing. So this is the result. So that's the way if you run this uh, build process you get this and as a side effect you also can generate a software bill of materials to be compliant and secure. So, conclusion. Hardening is possible. I have shown you how to do it with a script. As a systematic approach, uh, like EPCO is knocking at the door, it's not ready, and it might be that you need other base images than Alpine. Alpine is going very far at the moment, but uh, they are also implementing it for Debian. It is extremely reducing the size and the attack vector of an image. You get S-bombs for free. And this continuous security monitoring, continuous security monitoring is possible and it is easy. That's all I wanted to tell you. If you have questions, here are the links. I will, they will all be in the PDF. And if you need more information on that or other things, or if I should hack systems for you, um, then just contact me. So feel free to have questions now. Um, you will probably hate me, but um, have you tried already to harden Java applications? Um, Java is a little bit different. What I would try is to apply something like Graal or uh, Quarkus to the binaries and get statically linked Java executables. And then you can have only that executables in the container. It should be possible. Uh, I've tried Quarkus. There is no reason why you should uh, not do it this way, but it takes um, in your CI CD pipeline the, the Quarkus step now for a Hello World is 10 minutes on a real fast laptop. So this is something which probably developers don't like as much. But it's, it, it, at the end, it's possible, but a little bit different. Thank you. More questions? Yeah, thanks here for your presentation. I would like to ask, uh, what's your experience of trying to harden, uh, you know, systems that collect locks from the clusters? I collect locks from the clusters, so the, you especially for the debugging, also in production, of course. Um, if you would like to have logs, I'm uh, something. Um, then you need um, Fluentd or something like this in, in Kubernetes. And what I'm thinking about, if it would make sense, for example, to um, add hashes to every line in this. So um, normally collecting logs is completely okay. You can use Fluentds, but uh, and the, the story of the logs to prove that you haven't removed any line of the code would need uh, chained um, hash list or chained hashes uh, in that. Not, not, not a blockchain, please, but simply a ledger uh, and then you could prove it. But I've not seen it so far. I would do, uh, like to do it for audit logs because audit logs have the same problem. Um, it should be done, but um, this is a little bit of, uh, a different approach. It should work if if you if you can uh, imagine to sign or to hash and chain lock uh, entries. Yeah, thank you. More questions? Yes. So thank you very much. Maybe you have some experience talking about uh, how do you sell developers on containers without bash or terminal or something like that. Uh, uh, uh. 
how do you convince developers that it's worth it to harden <laughs> while they cannot um, uh, i'm I'm not convincing them security is uh, demanding that and then I give uh, the developer the advice how to do it as smooth as possible the, the entire security must be as smooth as possible because developers already have now 10 or even a hundred times more code on their disks so um, blocking developers by security is not an option you it, it, it must be as easy as, as possible and for a long time you can work with two versions of your container the debuggable and then okay we don't need to debug anymore we uh, I use now the hardened version and then uh, you turn on turn it on effectively it's not really blocking you and if 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 you have the guarantee that in your cluster runs everything as expected um it it, it might even have a value for developers but debugging is in 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 a hardened container might be very hard yeah yeah thank you Are there any tools to scan a hardened container for vulnerabilities? You can use the same tools like Trivi, and normally you don't see anything in that. Okay. So uh, I think, yeah. But I'm not absolutely sure if Trivi is uh, doing it right, but it looks like because it detects things which are not in the metadata. Normally, many scanner like, scanners like Claire only detect metadata in the container. But Trivi also detects uh, in static uh, Go applications if there are vulnerable libraries. So they are doing more than simply metadata scanning. So I, I would expect Trivi is the tool which can be used for that. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you for your talk. Uh, it was very interesting. I'm wondering if you could, um, if you could, um, what is the impact of um, uh, the programming language on the security? So, um, st statically typed languages uh, versus other uh, languages, for example. So, uh, uh, yeah, the the impact is uh, every l serious application. Uh, pulls a lot of libraries. And there might be a vulnerability in the library, like in Log4j shell, it was not the fault, not, not even the fault of Log4j shell, it was in GNDI and it was effectively not a bug, it was a feature, but everybody has forgotten the feature. And you see the same in nearly every language. You see it in Python, where you have typo squatting attacks. So I would say every language is susceptible to this kind of attacks to a certain level. But unfortunately, you need a different strategy to protect your language because the library organization is different in every language. So you need, for, for Python, you need to scan. Uh, if you don't have a typo squatting attack for Java, you need to look into the, have to integrate something in the Maven build. And the same for Ruby, and I would even say for Go, if you create a static library, it's the same as for Node.js, but the download of the entire internet, so that, that step is done at compile time. And uh, especially Node.js, the Node.js developers are very aware now because they had several issues and, and you can scan everything. My opinion, every library, uh, every language is vulnerable some, to a certain degree, and you have to adapt the strategy. More questions? Otherwise, I will be around until the end of the conference. Right. Thank you very much, Thomas Fricke. Okay. Thank you.